Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Anthony Bass, an associate professor at the NYU's postdoctoral program for psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, and faculty member at Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. Dr. Bass is an editor emeritus for Psychoanalytic Dialogues, president and faculty member at the Stephen Mitchell Relational Study Center, and a funding board director for IARPP. He also practices psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and supervisory consultation in New York City, and leads workshops and study groups worldwide. Welcome. It's very good to, to be here and an honor to, to be invited to, to lead off a, a conference uh, of this uh, magnitude and, and excellence. So thank you for, for having me. Um, I, I had intended to give a, a, a paper that I think you have now uh, gotten to, to read. And, and when I was speaking just the other day uh, to the organizers the, uh, about some of the technical uh, issues involved with uh, speaking on Zoom when you're all present. Um, we, we decided the idea emerged in, in our talk of giving a shorter version of the talk with the idea that you would have uh, had, had the opportunity to read it and that perhaps we could discuss things uh, a little later in the, in the morning. So that's what we're going to try and, and I will um, read a, a, a a shortened version of the paper that you have, and, and um, we'll see how it goes. I, I um, hope to be able to, to uh, read what I had in mind to share in about half an hour, um, but maybe it will take a little longer given um, the uh, issues of slowing down for translation. But let's see how it works. Um, so uh, the title of, of what I want to present is called unconscious communication between therapist and patient, the ordinary uncanniness of everyday psychoanalytic life, back to the future of psychoanalysis. The title for a series of talks on this theme at the William Allenson White Institute in New York, for which this paper was originally written, was The Uncanny Revisited. In the spirit of that revisitation, I begin by returning to Freud's 1919 monograph, The Uncanny. There, Freud explored the uncanny as a state of mind of special interest due to its relation to his, our main area of study, uh, the centerpiece of resistance of his new psychoanalysis, the science, we might prefer to say the art of the unconscious. Freud's uncanny constituted an intrapsychic phenomenon located squarely in the sites of Freud's developing one-person psychology. It referred to a feeling that most of us recognize, a shudder, a shiver in the bones, a chill, not from the cold, but rather manifesting that familiar skin-crawling feeling of dread. What we feel while walking through a cemetery at night or the shuddering feeling that arises when you notice that the date of your doctor's appointment to get your biopsy result is the same date that both your father and mother, father and sister died of cancer. Freud theorized that such feelings announce the presence of the unconscious as it is called forth from the depths of the current circumstances that evoke it. The unconscious arises to meet the moment. The moment registers the presence of the unconscious. And so the present is shaped by the resonances from the past that have been lurking unnoticed in the unconscious. From a two-person interpersonal relational perspective, a later development in psychoanalytic history, we might say that when the sense of uncanniness arises in a psychoanalytic or other relationship, it reflects the nearness of not one unconscious, but two, reflecting the special evocative power of two unconsciouses in dialogue in an intersubjective field. The uncanny that announces itself in a psychoanalytic session is constituted by the nearness of you and me, a special kind of intimacy constituted by its subtle brush with what is unconscious for each of us. This close encounter brings each of our unconsciouses closer to our joint awareness, 
bringing each of us closer to the other and the other in oneself. Our unconsciousness orient to one another via the divining rod of a psychoanalytic session, and we feel the effects of this encounter in the uncanny feeling that is our subject. What is unconscious move towards consciousness. What is conscious seeks its unconscious sources, such as the uncanny current of quotidian psychoanalytic life. Each analysis contains a body of unconscious work unlike any other. Each unconscious is infinite. It contains multitudes, as Walt Whitman wrote. It, ours, theirs, manifests in different ways in each analysis, regardless of how many analyses we conduct. It has been 40 years of conducting analyses for me, and in each analysis, each session, I encounter something in myself as it encounters something in my patient that is not altogether familiar. The encounter changes me in some way, large or small, as some part of myself undergoes an uncloaking. But this kind of ordinary uncanniness, familiar as it is to most of us, was not Freud's 1919 interest in the uncanny. He was immersed in building a model of the mind separate from other minds. The, the kind of porousness between minds that often lead to bi-directional unconscious communication between therapist and patient was not Freud's interest when writing his monograph. Rather, he referred to the spooky skin crawling of uh, feelings of dread that were a signal that the unconscious was near, making its way to consciousness, a disturbing, often dysregulating return of the repressed. The feeling constituted a kind of smoke alarm, signaling that the embers in our unconscious were heating up, ready to ignite and burst into flames when mixed with the oxygenated air of consciousness. He develops the aesthetic, aesthetic and linguistic arguments rich in literary sources in the service of his psychoanalytic idea. The affective states that he took as his subject were not the usual fare of aesthetics, typically feelings associated with beauty. Instead, Freud's interest was in states of fear, dread, and terror, a different aesthetic altogether, as he traced the origins of these states of mind to the unconscious. The unconscious empowered such states, containing the explosive accelerants capable of intensifying fear and anxiety to terror, dreams to nightmares. Freud took note of the linguistic connection between Heimlich, Homi, and its linguistic opposite, yet paradoxically its doppelganger, Unheimlich. Heimlich in German connotes what is both familiar, homey, and concealed in the home, not for the eyes of outsiders. Psychoanalysts recognize that home connotes familiarity, but not necessarily safety. It holds personal secrets, family secrets, intergenerational secrets, the stuff that trauma is made of, and cloaks what we know about its source. The secrets we keep from ourselves, behind ourselves, are familiar and unfamiliar at once, canny and uncanny. Have we been here before, or is it simply a case of deja vu? Unheimlich represented what was meant to remain secret and hidden, nobody's business, even your own business. The unheimlich is the skeleton in the closet. We meet it with shame or with a shudder. Ghosts are scary in part because they are familiar, but unfamiliar at the same time because we have banished them from our minds, dissociated them. We are haunted by what we know and don't know at the same time. We each see and touch our own ghosts, which are invisible to others who are not so haunted, but they have their own ghosts, ghosts to haunt them that we cannot see, and we don't have any special power, and, and those don't have any special power over us. The uncanny is not alien in its origin, Quite the contrary, it becomes alien through the process of repression or dissociation as it occupies a place of not me. Freud offers an evocative example from psychoanalytic experience. Quote, it often happens that neurotic men desire, declare that they feel there is something uncanny about the female genital organs. 
The unheimlich place, however, is the entrance to the home of all human beings, to the place where each of us lived once upon a time and in the beginning. There is a joking statement that love is homesickness, and whenever a man dreams of a place or a, or a country and says to himself, while he is still dreaming, this place is familiar to me, I've been here before, we may interpret the place as being his mother's genitals or her body. In this case, then, the unheimlich is what was once heimlich, familiar. The un is the token of repression. That, that was Freud. Lowold, uh, Mitchell, and Harris and her colleagues have picked up the ghost line of psychoanalytic thought. We are ghostbusters of the kind. As we move from a sense of being haunted by our ghostly internal objects to an acceptance and even welcoming of them back into the home of our conscious awareness, we allow them exit from the psychical closets to which they have been banished and shunned back into the embrace of our conscious minds. They come with baggage, which are working through when it is good enough, renders just light enough to bear. As we accept these parts of ourselves, we come to release our ghosts to live in our world, no longer ourselves concealed behind ourselves or ourselves beside ourselves, rather taking their rightful place as ourselves within ourselves the dimension of, psycho of uncanniness that I will take up now signals the presence of unconscious experience, but one that emphasizes not one, but two unconsciousnesses in dialogue, carrying messages back and forth between them that are remarkably telling. When we crack the code that allows us to hear their strange language, it has much to tell us about ourselves and one another. Such moments may evoke a sense of the telepathic, of clairvoyance or precognition. These are strange phenomena from the perspective of rational thought. Yet, for psychoanalysts, one unconscious communicating directly with another is our daily fare. Its extraordinariness, for the most part, subsumed under the umbrella of our special art. The extraordinariness of our daily encounters with the unconscious begins to feel ordinary after some years of practice. It's the water in which we swim. Freud's definition of psychoanalytic listening underscored the unconscious as the prime instrument of what we do and what we seek. The analyst must bend his own unconscious like a receptive organ toward the transmitting unconscious of the patient, adjust himself to the patient as a telephone receiver is adjusted to the transmitting microphone. Freud emphasized the ways in which we catch the drift of our patient's unconscious with our own. The analyst's unconscious in psychoanalysis was put to the service of its use as a highly sensitive listening instrument, while his or her discipline, captured in guiding principles such as neutrality, anonymity, mirror function, meant that its own transmitting function must remain well controlled, lest its reception by the patient's listening apparatus contaminate the process through which the transference, the sine qua non of analysis, must be free to develop unhampered. The in inevitable encounter between one unconscious and other, as Freud saw it, took place on what seemed to be a one-way street. His friend and fellow analyst Ferenczi, however, reported encountering crucial experiences with his patients that would bring him to forge a widened scope of understanding and enable him to consider bipersonal reciprocal dimensions of psychic experience and transformation. For Ferenczi, just as the analyst catches the drift of the patient's unconscious with his own, so does the patient catch the drift of the analyst in a reciprocal matrix of unconscious communicating, creating a complex, dense, and expanding network of messages constitutive of the analytic field. Terence, he wrote, when two people meet for the first time, an exchange takes place, not only of conscious, but also of unconscious stirrings. He coined the expression dialogue of unconsciousness to describe the observation that when two people converse, not only does a conscious dialogue take place, but an unconscious one too. He detailed the many forms 
that such reciprocal communication take in the transference counter transference field and demonstrated the impossibility of any secrecy between patient and analyst. The patient detects from little gestures, handshake, tone of voice, degree of animation, the presence of affects which may reveal to the patient more about the analyst than the analyst knows. Our psychoanalytic work contains many moments that reflect deep, often mystifying points of connection and receptivity, and it's always been so. Ferenczi noted in 1932 that such moments could not be explained in the present 1932 state of our knowledge of the physiology of sensory organs and of psychology. And we still don't know very much more, though neuroscientists are hard at work on it, looking at mirror neurons and other neurophysiological pathways that begin to shed some light. Ferenczi did take note of the remarkable frequency with which so-called thought transference, telepathic phenomena, occur between patient and analyst, and believed that the transference relationship itself quite significantly promotes the development of subtler manifestations of receptivity. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that later in terms of your own experience. I'd like to, to consider the relation between our imaginations and how we might make use of apparently anomalous experiences to deepen our analytic explorations, even as any, any certainties as to the nature of or limits of such experiences continue to elude us. Sometimes we glimpse the structure of the magic, the sleight of hand, like a magician reconstructing another magician's trick because he speaks the language of magic. And sometimes we don't. But even when we do, we can still appreciate the uncanny beauty of the magic. I wrote in my Whose Unconscious Is It Anyway paper of a patient who, upon my inquiry into what she might have gleaned about me as she was speaking of her to her frightening psychic powers, told me she knew exactly when my wife had had a miscarriage some months earlier. As we explored the source of her knowledge, she was able to describe just what, what she had discerned in my mood, complexion, and posture that gave the sad secret away to her. But she also described herself as a clairvoyant, wondering if the details of how she discerned our loss was really a post hoc rationalization of how she knew what she knew directly, absent the Holmesian deductions that could demystify a way of knowing that didn't warrant such mystification. She had some ideas about the origins and trauma of her gift for anomalous knowing. She had to know when her sexually abusive uncle was leaving his bedroom and coming down the hall to hers, and had many experiences to prove it. I accepted that what she saw in my face and in my body was not the whole story of what and how she knew. Another patient noticed my yawn in a session and in inquiring into its sources in me and in her as far as we could imagine them, we each found aspects of ourselves and each other that had eluded us. To consider the gamut of ordinary and extraordinary examples of unconscious communication broadens the scope of psychoanalysis in theory and practice, stimulating our imaginations to creativity or forcing an encounter with frustrating roadblocks when we don't heed Hamlet's maxim to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of. Our, our psychoanalysis is a place of dreams, nightmares, and strange events, where the boundaries of possibility are expanded by our imaginations. The work of, imagination, of psychoanalysis extends imagination's borders. We might say that anomalous experiences start off feeling that they are beyond imagination, which then may expand to encompass it, bringing it into the imaginative realm. In Bromberg's paper, Hidden in Plain Sight, Imagination and the Lived Unconscious, he wrote, I can only say that what came my way was beyond my imagination and ended up making me recognize that only by having to deal with something that exceeds imagination does imagination and in turn selfhood grow. 
When a patient responds to an analyst query by saying, I can't imagine that, a consideration of what is in the way of imagining and seeing what it might be possible to imagine if we try is often fruitful, clearing the way for new imaginings that have been stuck or included. In a very broad sense, Mitchell wrote, psychopathology might be considered a failure of imagination, a life that is stuck because old constraints foreclose the possibility of new experiences, new states of mind. The analyst can sometimes envision other ways of being and being with, other forms through which the patient's experience, both past and present, might be organized and developed. And that imaginative reshaping opens up new possibilities for the patient in thought and action. Encounters with various forms of the uncanny open up imaginative possibilities as long as we don't stop it. How could that be? That is not possible. It must be telepathy. She is clairvoyant. If we stop at that in a collision with the impossible and inconceivable, that crushed the possible under its weight. It doesn't tell us much about the patient or ourselves and may constitute an obstacle to letting the imagination get to the work and play of analysis. Like watching a great magician at work, if we think only about how he did the trick, we are in danger of missing the trick. The light we find and the light we shed has limits. The darkness of the unconscious remains abiding and deep, infinite the source of our dread and our creativity. There is something that comes of peering into the darkness as our eyes, and, uh, our ocular organs, and our eyes, our first person singular self, adjust over time and notices what we see there in the blackest dark. Robert Boswell, a contemporary writer about fiction, of and about fiction, made an observation in the half-known world on writing fiction, germane to psychoanalysis and to the anomalous kinds of knowing we have discussed. Quote, you're stepping into a terrain you only half know. This is where you need to be. There can be no discovery in a world where everything is known. A crucial part of the endeavor is the practice of remaining in the dark, ignoring the unexplainable, the quirky, the unconscious, the human slippage that makes people large and contradictory and fascinating. The work flattens and stagnates. Encounters with the uncanny remind us that we are in the dark. Recognizing that we are in the dark is no small part of what makes discovery possible. The reader or patient uh, or therapist all recognize themselves and, and don't, encountering the limits of their self-awareness. As, as analysis deepens, as we come to know ourselves better, we also know ourselves less well. We lose our bearings even as we seek to find them. We move beyond surfaces to creatively unknow ourselves and our patients. As in Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, proposed around 450 BC by the philosopher credited by Aristotle with inventing dialecticism, we recognize that we are in pursuit of understanding that will never be complete. We never quite catch up with ourselves or our patient. We get halfway there and half again. We will never entirely know her, even as our efforts to know her bring us to know more of ourselves and to recognize that there is more that we don't know than we knew. This is what we experience in our encounters with uncanniness, bringing some light to the unconscious while dimming the too bright light of consciousness. In the paper you read, I described a few of these uncanny events that we take as our daily fare after a few years of embeddedness in the extraordinary ways of listening that we practice. Here is a more extraordinary example of the head scratching end of the uncanny continuum. I was ricocheting around YouTube one night, following my associations and the AI algorithms into nostalgic viewing. 
Early musical favorites, the Beatles, James Taylor, Otis Redding, Al Green, Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Wonder. Then on to sports heroes from the same era of my youth, Ali versus Fraser, the Knicks championship in 1970. Then to an unbidden place that beckoned like Alice's rabbit, a college baseball game in Arizona. Had the YouTube algorithm pieced together that I was a pretty good pitcher in my youth, and so it jumped down this rabbit hole. The clip showed a college pitcher firing a fastball at the hitter at the plate, and then the magic happened. The ball disappeared into thin air for what seemed like minutes, but was probably really only seconds, stunning the crowd into confused silence. How could a pitch just disappear on its way to home plate in front of 5,000 fans? Then the slow motion camera revealed the sleight of hand as we could see the ball roll down from under the hitter's armpit into his hand, at which point he threw a perfect strike back to the pitcher as he trotted down to claim first base after being hit by the pitch. The crowd burst into a loud roar and the announcer yelled, that was the most unbelievable play I have seen in 30 years of announcing. You might wonder why I'm telling you this story. You probably had to see it to appreciate it. It was especially cool for me because it brought back my youth on the pitcher's mound. But that is not the main uncanny part. The uncanny part is that it found its way not into my dream, but my patient's dream. In his dream, we, he and I, were playing a strange game in a field of dreams between Freud's dread uh, laden uncanny and the exhilarating kind. His dream game was a combination of baseball and dodgeball in which the players, us, threw a ball hard at each other. And one of us got hit and didn't catch the ball, we would die. He threw a ball hard at me, lost sight of it, worried that he had hit me, that I hadn't caught the ball, which would mean that I was dead. Then, after an apprehensive dream moment, he was relieved to see that I had caught the ball under my arm, just like the hitter did in the clip I had seen the night before, and was relieved that we were both fine as the dream morphed from something approaching a nightmare to a magical exchange of remarkable choreographed play. It seemed to be a moment of thought transference of the kind Freud and Ferenczi conducted experiments on and discussed in no less than 75 letters between them. Like Freud, I wondered if this was a case of cryptoamnesia. Had he seen the clip and forgotten it? I did ask him if he had ever seen the clip. Catching the ball under the armpit was an unmistakable tell that the currents of our minds had crossed. He was amazed at my description and said no, he hadn't seen it. The main point I want to make about this is that we were both left in the dark about the coincidence or whatever it was itself, but continued to be interested in his dream and, and the coincidence and what it expressed in the context of our analytic work connectedness, being on the same wavelength, love, hate, competitiveness, aggression, and the threats it posed of loss, destruction, and death. We had both been ball players when we were, were young. It had come up in a few ways. We played the same sports, followed the same teams when we were young. We were about the same age. In sessions, we imagined playing together, being on the same team, or playing against each other as opponents. Whatever else it was, whatever kind of psychical event it manifested, it was first and foremost, in the context of our psychoanalytic work, a dream of both patient and therapist, a portal to and from our two unconsciouses. Dreams capture the unconscious of patient and analyst alike, an outcropping of a dialogue of unconsciouses, illuminating two unconsciouses at once. In this case, our unconsciouses were in dialogue the dream serving to bring part of the dialogue to light, while other parts would await future dreams and future enactments. It is useful in moments of the kinds of strange, mystifying knowledge of one another that arises in therapy to treat the moment as a dream. The same currents from the unconscious that make dreams accessible 
that make dreams are accessible through a range of psychic exchanges and analysis, including what we might think of as waking dreams, fantasies, imaginings. What occurs to us, what reverie does it evoke? What can we imagine about it? How might it link to what is familiar and not familiar? Heimlich and unheimlich. And what about the uncanny feelings that arise? What are those feelings like? They too bring memories, dreams, reflections. The uncanny feeling is itself grist for the mill of analysis. If we are analysts and not psi researchers, the important frame of reference for us is where such encounters with ourselves and each other take us in our explorations, no matter how mystifying they feel, how dark our surround. As the poet Rilke, known to take uh, talking walks with Freud as they discussed the experience of transience, wrote in his letters to a young poet, offering equally good advice to young and not so young analysts and, young, and not so young patients. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. And pay close attention to what arises inside of you and focus on it above everything that you notice outside of you. The following is an exchange between Alice and the White Queen in their 1871 journey through the looking glass. It was the very world that Freud would begin to map some 30 years later, as he followed his own dreams as a looking glass into his unconscious, dreaming up psychoanalysis along the way. Quote from Through the Looking Glass. I can't believe that, Alice said, when the queen told her that she was 101, five months and a day old. Can't you, the queen said in a pitying tone, Try again. Take a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. A few decades later, the time for such exercises in imagination would be extended to 50 minutes a day, six days a week. When Freud extended his own solo practice and personal dream analysis and invited his patients to take their position on the couch to bring their own journeys through the looking glass of psychoanalysis, to begin their own journeys. Alice discovered many things that anticipated what analysts and patients find. Time ran backwards. The queen remembered things best that happened the week after next. The queen let out a harrowing scream in pain at a needle pricked finger moments before the accident occurred. I haven't pricked it yet, she gasped, but I soon shall. Oh, oh. When she does draw blood, just a few moments later, Alice wonders why she isn't screaming now. Why, I've done all the screaming already. What would be the good of having it all over again? The queen is like our patients whose sufferings took place long ago and the places of pain cauterized, frozen, not accessible to feeling until the therapy brings the thaw. When the patient finally feels the stings of outrageous fortune for the first time as a result of diminished association, there is the possibility of a new beginning, as Balin put it. But this does not take place in a pain-free zone. Freud's deferred action Winnicott's fear of breakdown that has already occurred, Ferenczi's trauma, dissociation, and fragmentation, Bromberg's multiple self-states, these are all evident in the world that Alice saw most clearly with her eyes shut tight. Thomas Ogden noted that dreaming continually occurs both during sleep and in waking life, though we have little awareness of our dreaming while we are awake. Reverie and free association constitute forms of pre-conscious waking dreaming. Dreaming conceived of in this way is not a process of making the unconscious conscious. Rather, it is a process of making the conscious unconscious, making conscious lived experience available to the enriched thought processes involved in unconscious psychological work. Dreaming is the process by which we attribute personal symbolic meaning to our lived experience. And in this sense, we dream ourselves into existence. 
Analysts and patients invite one another to make the unconscious conscious and the conscious unconscious in our own journeys through the looking glass of psychoanalysis, where we dream ourselves and one another up in uncovering, discovering, and rediscovering our own imaginations and thus ourselves and each other. The uncanny experiences that we create with our patients in the lives we live together in analysis are integral to this remarkable process of discovery and rediscovery that we call psychoanalysis. So that's, that's the part that I thought I would read for you this morning. Thank you, Tony. Anybody there? Tony, thank you for this fascinating talk. We'll now take questions from the audience. Great. As we're going to ask you now questions from the audience. מישהו רוצה לשאול את טוני על ההרצאה או על הקריאה של המאמר? אז בואו תגידו את זה בקול רם, אנחנו נתרגם או שתבואו תגידו באנגלית. Okay, so we'll start with a question of our own. So in the uh, paper you sent us, you mentioned that the word uncanny, though it's not one of the uh, pillars of psychoanalytic theory, right? It appears 4,000 times in a pap search, right? <laughs> yes. And I think, well, you said it signifies the increasing interest in the mystical and spiritual in psychoanalysis, um, a kind of renaissance, I would say, after Jung's rejection by Freud. And uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts as to why uh, this is happening, and uh, I think in the last few decades, right? And um, also, is it, do you think it's a part of the relational turn? Well, I, I think I think it is in in the sense of of the the um, the second meaning. I think one one of the things about the the uncanny that I uh, that this paper meant to illustrate is that the the uh, meanings of of a word in psychoanalysis uh, capture different currents and, and valences in the field according to who's using them, you know, in, in the same way that, that uh, transference has a different set of meanings and emphases in more classical psychoanalytic perspectives than in more relational perspectives, which emphasize, let's say, a transference counter-transference field. So I think that, that there's a... Um, a mix in, in the, the citations of, of the word uncanny in the psychoanalytic literature between those that are using it in the Freudian sense, in, in, in the sense of a feeling one has um, that, that provide a kind of uh, announcement of the unconscious arrival uh, in, a, in a kind of one-person model. You know, and then there's the, the uh, emphasis in this relational term that you're speaking of, in, in which following Ferenczi, as well as, as Jung, the, the relationship bet, bet, uh, between one unconscious and another, in, in a, in a uh, Jungian sense, a, a more kind of uh, collective, universal set of, of symbols linked to the unconscious, in, in Ferenczi's sense, a more personal um, set of, of uh, encounters b between one person and another that are taking place largely in uh, the unconscious realm. So I think, I think the, the, the interest in 
th these kinds of mystifying exchanges that have a kind of um, um, profoundly, um, uh, you know, they're profoundly uncanny in, in the sense of, of the shiver has to do with, with how is that possible? How could she have known that? How could she have dreamt the dream last night? Of, of my, you know, personal life uh, as she dreamt it. I think those, I think the interest in those kinds of exchanges that bring the analyst and patient directly into it in terms of what each of them are contributing have, have been importantly linked to, to the relational term, which has been interested in what two people are co-creating together, consciously and unconsciously. Thank you. So there's a question from the crowd. One moment, please. Okay. So Liat from the audience is asking, um, could you say how this uncanny moment contributes to the therapeutic process? The, you know, are you talking about a, a, one of these moments in general, or the particular moment that I was speaking of in the in, in the example of? of uh, in general. Uh, well, um, how, how do these moments contribute to the psychoanalytic process? Is the question? Mm -hmm. Is that? Uh -huh. Well, I think um, as I as I tried to show, I think one could see these moments as a kind of surfacing of a dream in, in which the, the, uh, the source of the dream, in, in, in whose mind, in, in, in your mind, in your analyst's mind, in, in your mind, in your patient's mind, that the source of, of, of the dream is, is um, unknown. It's, it's, it's to be discovered. So I, I think that these moments lend themselves to uh, sort of um, committing oneself to the, the, uh, the, the unknownness, the committing oneself to the, the kind of mystifying sense of, of we don't know through which means this particular experience has arrived. And, and so I think that then lends itself to a kind of exploration that, that, um, that underscores the uncertainty of, of our, our being, our exchange, our moment in, in, in time space. And, and so I think if used in that way, it can open up and free up both the therapist and the patient to, to attend to their own um, unconscious reveries, uh, images that are, that are, um, that, that are uh, emerging, that are arriving, um, that arrive first from the, the experiencing of such a moment. But, but, but the experiencing of such moments opens a door, I think, potentially to further freedom and openness, both to aspects of the patient and aspects of ourselves that are, are as yet un, untraveled. So it opens up a tolerance to the unknown, the ability to contain it. To um, contain it, to, yeah, to, to be with it, to uh, be interested in it, to, to, to uh, play with it. Um, so it's as though in such moments, we might think of ourselves as entering a kind of joint dream, like a, a, a place where, where we can think about our, our, each of our unconsciouses participating, offering its, you know, its mark, almost like a Winnicottian squiggle game in, in, in which each of us is registering the other's unconscious and, 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 and our own as, we, we, as this encounter occurs and, and the encounter often takes us by surprise because we, we find 
that we, we suddenly are in a place that we had no idea that we were going. Yeah. Much like a dream. Okay, any other questions? Maybe also think about um, if you'd like. And <laughs> I was going to say. Asking in English, but far away. Okay. The relationship here. Yeah. The relationship between the unhappy. Yeah, I heard that. I can't hear it now. If someone's speaking, I can't hear it now. When you have an epiphany, When you have an epiphany. When you have an epiphany, it's like an metaphysical, a metaphysical moment. moment. And, and it's like going through, and in, in one mere second, you become a different person. You're not the same person you were even a second ago. It's like going through a gate and... and Have you heard this, Tony? No, I, someone was translating like that if you have an epiphany. between the uncanny and the moment of epiphany. I'm sorry, would, would you repeat that? I missed part of what you said. She asked about the relationship between the uncanny and the moment of epiphany. Uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, maybe a transcendence. When you become, she said, when you become another person. When you become another person, do you, do you mean when you become... Same, same person? You're the same person, but you're not the same person you were a second ago. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not... The same I'm, person, but not the same person as you were a second ago. Uh -huh. You mean when you, when you experience a sense of a personal transformation yeah. as, yes. a, as a function... Yeah, meant. Mm -hmm. As a function of something about the encounter with your fellow traveler in, in the analytic process? Do you mean like when you, when 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 you become in a certain way enlightened, even as things are very dark, right? Like being being enlightened, even as you embrace the darkness. Yes, I think enlightenment is the word, and I think it's a good question because psychoanalytic transformation, which often does feel like an enlightenment, is not necessarily uh -huh. the same as an uncanny moment. So. I think I'm making the question. I, 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 I think I think the the what's uncanny is is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. You know, certainly in in Freud's definition, uncanniness was a certain kind of experience. You and I might not have the same sense of uncanniness, right? That that. Uh, as I, as I said in the, in the presentation, each of us has our own um, tunnels to, to our unconscious. We have our own ghosts. So um, your uncanny might be my rational life. My uh, uncanny might be yours. I think in, in, in these moments of, uh, the, of a kind of two-person uh, uncanniness in which we might say, um, there's something just, um, something occurs between us and we can't make sense out of it with reference to what is available to us consciously. In, in following that down the, the, the rabbit hole, as in the, as in the reference to Alice in Wonderland, we, we find ourselves in, in new places, having new experiences that, that we had not met before. And in that sense, might very well feel like this is, uh, is this me? Is this not me? Is it, is it um, 
If it's not me, how do I uh, expand my sense of, of me to, to, have a, uh, to have a kind of, um, to embrace more, you know, to embrace more of, of myself that, that I hadn't known was there. And I, I feel like that's a, a very, I think it, it's part of what I feel is a very fundamental part of the work that we do, that in encountering our partner, whether that's our, our therapist or our patient, in opening ourselves up as, as radically as we can to, to knowing them, we, we really have no choice as part of our commitment to an ethic of the work to open ourselves up to parts of ourselves that we haven't encountered before. And yet, they're, they're not completely unfamiliar, right? That was the, the, the sort of link to Freud's idea of the, the Heimlich and the Unheimlich. We, we have a sense uh, that uh, I don't quite recognize this as me, but it also doesn't feel completely alien. As I encounter it more fully, it becomes less alien and, and more me. And, and so the sense I have of myself becomes more expansive. I think that's one of the things that, that um, is, is, a, is a, um, an aspect of, of what we might mean by, by analytic wisdom, you know, by the wisdom of, of analysts who have been at it for a while. I analytic think that, that... Did you say analytic wisdom? Yes, I, I, I think that, that as, as we get, you know, one of the few advantages of, of getting older uh, in, in our field of, of analytic work is that over the years, as we work with more and more patients and go further and further with many patients, I think we come to see more, as, more of ourselves. We, we, we get to know ourselves better because each patient brings us in touch with more of ourselves, more of this, this uh, Whitman uh, sense of the multitudes that each of us carry. One of the great gifts of being an analyst is that you get to encounter more and more of, of the multitudes that, that uh, abide in you. And, and, and as you become more and more familiar with more of yourself, then you come to recognize aspects of, of your patients who are, are earlier in the process of beginning to know more of themselves. And, and so I, I think that, that as I've worked over the decades, I, I feel like each session, each month, each year, each patient brings new aspects of myself to myself in, in, in a way that is uncanny in the sense of it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the newness is always new. You know, the newness is always in some way taking my, me by surprise to meet another part of myself. And yet there's something about that process that becomes more familiar and more bearable over, over time. So maybe the uncanny moment is like a beacon inside this context yeah. of relationship on the way to transformation, on the way to getting to know more parts of ourselves. Right, and, and mutually so. I think that's the part that that's represents the, the relational term. By the way, if people would like, um, I'm very happy not only to hear questions and reflections, but if you have an experience or a moment or an example, um, that could also be very, very interesting to hear about too. Okay, so, uh, Noga? Thank you. 
שמת, כי אסור היה להשאיר את הרגל שלו, ואבא שלו אמר לו בביטחון, סבא שלי אמר לו בביטחון, אין מה לפחד מהמתים, רק אנשים חיים יכולים להזיק. מתים לא מזיקים. ועם התחושה הזאת אבא שלי גידל אותנו, ואנחנו הלכנו לבתי הגברות מגיל צעיר מאוד. זאת אומרת, באמת חוויה ש... גוסט זה לא דבר רע, גדלנו עליה. ואני חושבת שזה עניין תרבותי. ואם אנחנו הולכים לגוסט בדלילינג רום, זה מקום תרבותי שחושב שרוח זה רק דבר רע. And about an, uh, an experience when she was a child, her father told her a story about uh, him having to uh, guard a, a corp uh, when, she was, when he was seven years old. And he was uh, eventually afraid. And his father told him, oh, you shouldn't be afraid from uh, the dead, only from the, only from the living. Uh, mm. And... Uh, and mm. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> right. Naga, Naga was playing with the meanings of the word spirit and ghost, which in Hebrew are the same. Yeah, and, spirit. And uh, she, she was saying that that's a cultural thing, whether you should... Cultural thing. Yeah, yeah. But you know, my, my association to, to that story, which is very uncanny in the, in, the sense that, in the sense that each of us might have a bit of a shiver in, in thinking about the story, thinking about the child's position, thinking about the, the intimate moment with his father trying to be reassuring. Yet there's a, a, a deep message, I think, in, in the father's comment, which is, um, in, a, in a way, it, it's, it's, a, it's akin to saying, don't be afraid of death. It's life that's the struggle, right? That, it, that it, it, it's life. We, we, we're so terrified, so many of us, of, of dying. And yet, um, we didn't exist for the eons before we were born, and, and we won't exist after we die. And, and, and um, you know, thus the expression, rest in peace, you know, that, 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 that death is a state of, of un being, unknowing peace and, 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 and that it's in life that, that, we, um, that we encounter our challenges and, 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 and the, the sort of um, the difficulties of being conscious creatures with, with, with minds and self-awareness. So it's, it's a very deep um, story, really, as, as, as to what it is that we fear, um, how we think about the, the you know, how, how, we th how we think about our, our ghosts, how we think about our dreads, how we think about what it is that, that most frightens us, which, which certainly death is, is high on the list for most of us. Maybe the uncanny binds together the fear of death and the fear of the unconscious, which maybe yes. are connected by the fear of the unknown. I but think uh, that that's right. We'll that's right. To, and the loom. Yeah, we'll have to finish. Uh, um, yeah, we're about to finish. We would like to thank you very much for being here with us all the way from New York. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so well, much. There were many more questions, but we, we want to make it. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're, being left, we're being left with uh, many... Uh, Raised hands that didn't get, get an answer, but, well, next time. <laughs> great. great. Well, I just want to thank you all for having me and for inviting me and, and, and for being here and, and for making all the effort to hear a talk in, in a language that's not your, your first language. and, and uh, so I, I very much appreciate your, your listening and being present and inviting me and having the interesting questions that you had. And, and uh, hope maybe at some point I'll have a chance to hear more of your questions.
questions and reveries. And, and, but until then, we thank you all very much, and especially also Alice and Samek Asif for, for having me here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.